I am sorry not to be able to be present at this uh, most interesting and timely conference. It's clear to me and to many others that anarchism has become a potent political force in the last decades, especially as it challenges the G8, focuses attention on environmental dangers, opposes the apartheid wall in Palestine, and offers new formations of political community. I can hardly do justice to anarchism as tactic or anarchism as political philosophy and practice or anarchism as mode of life or as an ethos of intensity. It has surely assumed all those dimensions in contemporary political life. What I would like to do in the short time that I have is to focus more precisely on anarchism and the question of Palestine since there is quite clearly a set of conundra that emerge from any con consideration of this topic. On the one hand, it is clear that anarchists against the wall, originally called anarchists against the fence and Jews against ghettos, have represented a radical resistance to the occupation and continue to show up, put their bodies on the line in various villages along the path of the separation wall. There is no question that the weekly demonstrations at Bilin where many have suffered physical injury and death, the important triumph at Budris to steer the wall away from the olive trees, the persistent rallying of support in Sheikh Jarrah for those threatened with the confiscation of their homes and those whose homes have already been transferred to Jewish Israelis, the important engagement with Ta'ayush during the second intifada when medical supplies were illegally um, transported into the West Bank, these have been but a few of many insistent and important political actions against an illegal occupation. They are undertaken mainly by Israeli citizens, both Jewish and Palestinian, and they constitute acts of civil disobedience and anti-authoritarian politics on the part of citizens who seek to resist state policies and on occasion resist Zionism and the state itself. To a certain extent, these are actions that are not only intended to support Palestinians, but to work within the terms of their own resistance, and even to enter into political action only when explicitly invited. And yet it makes sense that anarchism would not be the name for the struggle undertaken by Palestinians living under the occupation or in Gaza, where the Israeli siege continues the occupation after the withdrawal of its settler population, because it's, it continues to exercise complete control over the border, decide what goods move in and out, vets, human rights, and NGO workers, undertakes bombardments, often against civilian populations, that destroy both lives and the infrastructural conditions of life. Anarchism, when defined explicitly as anti-authoritarian or as anti-statist, assumes the existence of a state against which it rallies. In some forms, as we know, Anarchism has now focused on global corporate monopolies, which displaces the centrality of the state as the primary site of opposition. So we've seen the possibility for anarchism to shift its object of opposition to broader technological and corporate forms of exploitation, especially as they produce extreme differentials of wealth and expose vast populations to conditions of precarity and economic destitution. So if the object of resistance is either the state or networks of corporate exploitation and monopoly, what about enduring forms of colonial state power? Does it make a difference how one interprets the occupation when one opposes the occupation? In other words, can anarchism conceptualize its resistance to the occupation as an opposition to settler colonialism? After all, forms of land confiscation and territorial expansion work in tandem with the denial of the right to political self-determination to a population whose employment, mobility, freedom of expression, electoral rights, rights against imprisonment for political viewpoints, rights to life itself, and against harassment, invasion, and bombardment are at issue. Moreover, it's possible for the occupation to be understood as a form of settler colonialism that continues the project of settler colonialism that is Zionism. I'm not for a moment doubting that there are anti-Zionist anarchists in Israel. I'm trying to make another suggestion here, namely that the lexicon for understanding the problem of Palestinian oppression may well differ in Palestine and in Israel, 
and that this bears consequences for thinking about why anarchism is not the name of of Palestinian resistance. In turn, this raises the question of the limits of Israeli-Palestinian alliance. It is, of course, odd to say this, when the anarchists have been among the most successful of Israeli leftists to forge those alliances. And this is a point not lost among Palestinians. But it's precisely because anarchism has been among the most successful efforts that I want to press this point a bit further, since the chasm between Israeli resistance to the occupation and the Palestinian struggle for self-determination still remains large. As I read the incredibly thorough and thoughtful book, Anarchy Alive, by Uri Gordon, published in 2008 by Pluto Press, I found myself wondering whether the version of Israeli anarchism he defends in his final chapter is one that opposes the state but never quite escapes the nation. Are there forms of community produced through anarchist resistance to the state that remain dependent on that state for their mode of resistance? Or are they formed, as it were, to the side of the state without being negatively determined in relation to the state. In a way, this is the age-old question of whether a dialectical relation holds between anarchy and state power, or whether anarchy can and does produce an ethos and mode of sociability that escapes that dialectical determination, or that emerges as a third term effectively exceeding the dialectical opposition which forms its condition. And yet, in this particular case, I am asking whether the argument for anarchism as an ethos of sociability depends upon citizenship or, minimally, a national frame. After all, citizens can and do perform civil disobedience together. But to speak of the civil disobedience of the non-citizen does not make sense. The non-citizen who is struggling either for citizenship or for, or for some other mode of, of political self-determination, and let us keep those aims distinct for the moment, struggling, that is, against a form of domination and disenfranchisement in order to achieve a legible and effective mode of political self-determination. To engage in civil disobedience or to engage in actions that seek to jam the machinery of the state is to risk jail and imprisonment as a citizen. And under extreme conditions, that citizenship can be revoked by the state to be sure. We are, in fact, presently witnessing the expansion of the legal definition of treason in Israel to encompass all acts, including the public documentation of civilian casualties in Gaza, as potentially treasonous. I do not, for a moment, underestimate the kinds of risks that Israeli citizens have taken and take. And yet I want to call attention to the institution of citizenship, that is, how citizenship is systematically instituted and de-instituted. Citizenship within the established state has always been regulated in order to maintain Jewish demographic advantage. The expansion of settler communities within Palestine has been a way of establishing Jewish-Israeli political rights to the land and the extended sovereignty of the state of Israel. Most clearly, the occupation constitutes a mode of militarized power that limits and undercuts Palestinian self-determination. It is colonial power that acts when Israel retains for itself the sovereign right to approve or disapprove of the results of Palestinian elections, the right to invade at will, to expand its settlement populations within Palestinian lands, and to maintain full military control over the borders of the Palestinian territories, which then become sites for ritual harassment intimidation, and injury at the checkpoints. So from within the borders of Israel, and for Israeli Jews in particular, the state appears as authoritarian, which is why Gordon's subtitle proclaims anarchy's opposition to to authoritarianism. One fights against Israel's militarism and its policies understood as authoritarian. But to frame the struggle only within such terms is to accept not only the perspective of citizenship, but perhaps its privileges as well. And this is why, in my view, it's not really adequate, since it is the institution of citizenship and the management of its de-institution that links the occupation to settler colonialism and links settler colonialism to Zionism and the corollary 
presumption, ever more fiercely amplified by Israeli law, that Israel is a Jewish state based on principles of Jewish sovereignty, and that even Palestinians who wish to retain their citizenship there must now publicly declare fidelity to those very principles. Of course, I was among many who were taught, well, the kibbutzim are an exception to all of this. Some of them were enclaves for anarchists, communists, and anti-Zionists. Hannah Arendt reserved words of praise for them and generally followed Martin Buber's cultural Zionist justifications for the kibbutzim. Uri Gordon's chapter on homeland, anarchy, and joint struggle in Palestine-Israel thus begins in this same spirit with a quotation from Emma Goldman in 1938 where she remarks that, and I quote, the fact that there are many non-Zionist communes in Palestine goes to prove that the Jewish workers who have helped the persecuted and hounded Jews have done so not because they are Zionists, but so that they might be left in peace in Palestine to take root and live their own lives, end quote. On the one hand, it's historically true that some Jews came to Palestine not because they are Zionists, and indeed that continue, continues to be true um, um, regarding immigration from North Africa to this day, but because they wanted the chance to work the land or to live in communal structures to experiment with socialist ideals. And prior to 1948, there were active debates among Jews in Palestine over the pros and cons of Zionism. Indeed, those debates continue, I would say, in diminished form after the vanquishing of the proposals for a binational, binational federated authority in 1947, and then faded from public discourse, surviving only on the margins after the 1967 war. And yet, I think we have to ask about the link between contemporary anarchist communities and those that existed within the early kibbutz movement. Are, the, are there really analogies here, or should there be? At issue is whether or not the early kibbutz movement, even those parts of it who gave safe haven to European anarchists, was not engaged in land confiscation and the forcible dispossession of populations undertaken in the name of a larger national liberation movement. Indeed, when Emma Goldman says that those uh, non-Zionist Jews wanted only to be left in peace in Palestine to take root and to live their own lives, um, she does not say in whose land they wish to take root and whether living their own lives um, was an effort to live them to, with, um, uh, with the exclusion, um, by, by excluding the indigenous um, Arab Palestinian population. I would direct your attention to the important scholarly work of Gabriel Peterberg, in particular his book, The Returns of Zionism, published by Verso in 2008. Indeed, it would be interesting to read this book together with Uri Gordon's book published that same year to understand the differences in perspective that concern me here. According to Peterberg's extensive research in this area, even the early kibbutz movement was determined by, and I quote, the conditions and desires of colonization, end quote. Colonization programs developed for Germans in Eastern Europe provided the basis for the work of Franz Oppenheimer, a German Jewish settlement expert. The point was to find and take over farms that could be sustained self-sufficiently, that is, without any reliance on external labor. In 1911, he, Oppenheimer, developed a plan for colonization that could be implemented either in Palestine or in Africa. Peterberg also points to the key contribu contribution of Arthur Ruppin, understood as the father of Jewish settlement, who established the Palestine Land Development Comp 